I learned a little chorus a couple of years ago from my friend Morris Chapman. I want to teach it to you today. It's very simple. It goes like this. I lay it all down. I lay it all down. I lay it all down in worship. I lay it all down. I lay it all down. I lay it all. Sing it with me. I lay it all down. I lay it all down. I lay it all down. In worship. Now just listen to this middle section. I lay down my foolish pride, all the things I've held inside. My future and my past, all the things that will not last. I lay down. Lost for fame and high position. The gift that I can give is the life I choose to live. I lay it all down. Do it right now, Saint. I lay it all down I lay it all down In worship I lay it all down I lay it Lay it all down in worship. I lay it all down. I lay it all down. I lay it all. to you, Jesus, in worship. Today I lay it all down. I lay it all down. I lay it all down.
We lay it all down this afternoon, Lord. We lay it all down. We lay down our foolish pride, all the things we've held inside, our future and our past, and those things that will not last. We lay down all our ambitions, our lust for fame and high position. The gift to you that we can give is the life that we choose to live. We lay it all down. We lay it all down. I don't know if I've ever sung a song that means any more to me than just that simple song and my devotion to the Lord. Doesn't that say it all? It does, doesn't it? It says it all. And every time we come to Him, that's how we need to come. We need to empty everything out. For you see, what can you offer him <laughs> that he doesn't already have? He made everything. Do you think he's impressed with how well I play the piano? He's the one that taught me. Do you think he's impressed with how well you can sing? You get these rock stars on the stage and they want to show you their great gifts and they think that they are some gift to the earth and the father laughs on his throne. He laughs. You get the big uh, football stars, soccer stars and those that are paid millions and millions of dollars a year and they walk around like you can't touch them and the father says, do you know how small you are? You're like this big. He laughs at the ego of man. <clears throat> he laughs at the pride of man. If you don't remember anything else I say today, remember this. God is always, always, always opposed to the proud. Always. In every area of your life. And God always, always, always gives grace to the humble. Always. Regardless of what you've done, you come to God in a spirit of true humility and He will bless you. Can everyone understand English? Do I, do I have to have an interpreter? Is there anyone you cannot understand English? I would love just to be able to speak and not use an interpreter this afternoon, just for a few minutes. Okay, be seated. We're going to do it without. Lay it all down. Lay it all down. I've been in ministry for 36 years and I have to continually go back and lay it all down. When I was at the very height of ministry several years ago and and in 30 days my name and my ministry was in a hundred nations around the world. I sold 100,000 CDs in one month's time through a major ministry. And at that place, and then at the lowest place of my life just a few years ago, when I just fell off everything and I imploded on the inside. And my marriage came to an end and life was awfully hard. I was the same person that I was up there, a sinner in need of a great Savior. Listen, folks, at your very best day, you're a great sinner in need of a great Savior. 
And in your worst day, you're a great sinner in need of a great Savior. Don't ever let anybody tell you anything else. In this flesh dwells no good thing. We are only what he breathes through us. If anything good, it comes from God. It will never change. You were born into sin. I was born into sin. And if you're guilty in one point of the law, you're guilty of the entire law. Who can stand? Who can stand? That's why we must understand grace. We must understand grace. We have no concept of how much grace it took for God to send Jesus to the earth. No concept of how much grace the Father had to engulf us in a love that was without reason. There was no reason for him to love us. We had nothing, you know, when, when we have children on the earth, they are beautiful little babies. I saw this little baby on, on television last night. It's just so beautiful. And I said to Liz, oh, I would just love to hold a newborn baby again because they're so perfect. They're, but you know what? They're not. They are just as sinful because they're born into that. You don't have to commit an awful sin to be an awful sinner. We must realize this in the church. We categorize sin. We make one thing worse than the other. It's not. If you're guilty of cheating on a test, you're guilty of murder, the word says. You're guilty of the whole law. If you wish you had your neighbor's car instead of yours, it's the same thing as adultery and stealing and jealousy. We need a savior for that. Because he kept the whole law. He was never guilty in even one point of the law. For one moment in time, the father found a sacrifice that was once and for all. And we cling to Jesus now. That blood we sang about, it will never lose its power. There will never be another need for a sacrifice. Amen? Amen. He loves us so much. If you were the only person that ever lived, he would have even died for you. Pastor, even for you. For you. He would have done everything that he did. He would have come to the earth to destroy the works of the evil one for you, Charlie. Just for you. How can this be? What love. That's why we worship. That's why we come together and sing these love songs. Can I read you a poem? It's not really a poem. It's something that someone wrote and sent to me. This, should, this is written from a lady's point of view, okay? But this represents the whole body of Christ. Now let me read this. It's called The Unexpected Dance. I'm looking around waiting for my partner in the outer room, the courts of his chambers. With anxious thoughts, will he notice me? Do I look all right as I stand dressed in white and my face veiled waiting for my partner to arrive? Then the throne room door opens and with all eyes captured on Jesus. There he is, my Lord and Savior. How magnificent, how majestic, how glorious. Oh, but then I put my head down and sigh. He wouldn't pick me. I'm so unworthy. But then I feel a gentle hand lifting my head 
and removing my veil as his loving eyes embrace with mine. He takes my hand and walks to the center stage. I notice people gazing in awe with a smile and a sigh as he holds my waist and presses his face close to mine and whispers, I love you, precious bride. I'm overwhelmed with tears pouring out of my heart and streaming down my face, speechless, saying silently in awe, Jesus picked me. He picked me as his partner, his bride, and best friend. This night and forevermore, Jesus picked me as we continue to float across and circle, my dress flowing, swishing to and fro, dusting the throne room floor. Our feet never once touched the holy ground. I followed right in step alongside, and he swiftly turned and graciously leaped as though we were dancing high above the clouds and entering through the gates of heaven. Nothing else mattered but his masculine, gentle, loving presence. My heart rapidly fluttered inside with an outpouring of his Holy Spirit's joy. Now I'm holding my head up high with a glow and a capturing smile, as if to say with a loud shout, look at me, I've been chosen. I've been chosen to dance with the King, Jesus. The Lord of my life, my beloved bridegroom, Jesus. My brother and best friend, this gentle man named Jesus. My first love, my forever love. The name above all names, Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? Someone sent that to me years ago, and it's touched my life that he would pick you to dance with him. Can you imagine him coming into this room and walking to the front and coming right to you and say, I want to dance with you. Woo! I want him to dance with me. Pick me, Jesus. I want to look into your eyes, the eyes of the lover of my soul, the one that has healed me throughout my life, the one who has always picked me up when I have fallen, the one who every day of my life intercedes for my needs to the Father, the one who was with my little 12-year-old son, when he fell off his brand new bicycle on Christmas Day and his arm was shattered on the road. And I went to him and I bowed over him and I said, Peace, Jesus. Peace. And he was there. The one who has walked with me on the highest mountain and the lowest valley. The one who wrote, I sing praises to your name and gave it to me in a prayer room. Who is this one? Isn't this amazing? Would you like to dance with him? Yes. <laughs> Let's dance. <laughs> Just imagine, this is how special every single redeemed person is to Jesus. Think of the Son of God, the Most High God, walking in here. He is God himself. Walking in here and choosing you for a dance. Liz, you'd be beside yourself.
I love to dance with Jesus too. I can't even dance. But I would learn very, I let him do the dancing. I just go along for the ride. Robin, would you like to dance with Jesus? Amen. I just think about the sun looking into my eyes. And your entire life, you know he would be looking at your entire life. You see, he's loved you in spite of everything. He knows you better than you know yourself, and he loves you. And when those eyes meet yours, it's like every single moment of your life is right there. And you go, I'm helpless. And he takes your hand. He says, I've always been your help, but I have nothing to offer, but I am everything to you. He's our connection to the Father. He's so real. I remember ministering in a little church in the United States in Pennsylvania. And I, I, I opened the altars and said, while we worship, if you would just like to come forward and kneel or whatever, you can just spend time with the Lord around the altar. And so people began to come up, 30, 40, 50 people. It was a packed church, a little larger than this. Every seat was filled that day. And we were worshiping, and then over here I started to hear some noise. And there was a lady, she was kneeling at the altar and she said, it's real. It's real. It's real. It's real. And she got louder and louder and louder. And she stood up like she was going to charge the platform to grab me. Because something happened to her that had never happened to her before, right there, worshiping Jesus. She caught his eyes. The eyes of God looked right at her. And she went, oh, it's real. It's real. I've got to tell somebody. And she wanted to run around. They were holding her down. But you see, when the life of God hits you, and you know that you know it's real. You can't contain him. William, you can't contain him when he comes over you. He goes everywhere through you. And I talked to someone about this lady after the service. I talked to the pastor. I said, do you know this lady? Yes. She actually used to be on the custodial, the janitors of our church. And she got mad, and she left the church. We had to fire her. And she just came back to church today for the first time. And so here was a lady, broken, empty, nothing, nothing to offer. Came forward in humility, not in pride, in humility and just fell on the altar. And right there, life met her for the first time. She had never known him until that day. Oh, she had gone through the motions. She had gone to church. She was in every service. She had sung the songs that we sing. She had read her Bible, but she never knew him. Like when he looks in your eyes. There's a difference in knowing about him and knowing him. Paul said, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. I don't want to just read about this man. I don't want to just have all the knowledge of this man. I want to dance with him. I want him to take me and we go like this because I am the lover of him. Amen. The bride of Christ, we are the lover of Jesus. We are his girlfriend. 
When we worship together like last night, you remember last night and how the song of the Lord began to break out. That was the love song to the bridegroom. And when we do that, he puts, I can see the Father in heaven putting his hands up and going, wait a minute, angels, don't sing right now. My lover is singing to me in the Netherlands. My lover is in Amsterdam. They're, they're writing a new song for me tonight. Whoo, the song of the redeemed. What a beautiful love song. He loved it. And you know what? Satan cannot counterfeit that. Because what you sang last night will never be sung again. That group of people will never sing that exact song again. It's never been sung before. It will never be sung again. That's why the Father loves it. Ooh, ooh, ooh. It's a brand new love song going up from the earth to the lover of our souls. I, I always look for that time in a service when I feel the anointing go from the platform out to the people. And when that song broke out last night, that's when it happened. It doesn't always happen. I do many services and it doesn't happen. I can't make it happen. All I can do is create an atmosphere and hope that the Holy Spirit has his way with your life. Why did it happen? Because you, as worshipers, chose to enter into that last night. See, you didn't, you didn't sit back and say, let's watch Terry sing. <laughs> that gets really old in about five minutes. I played one big song at the beginning. That's all we need to mess with that. Now let's worship together. Let's Join together. You see, God didn't come to this meeting, to this conference, to hear Terry play the piano. He came to hear the bride minister to the bridegroom. He came to see his son lifted up on the praises of his people. And the Holy Spirit, who is here again today, sitting with you, standing with me, He doesn't come to be lifted up. He comes to lift up the sun. Isn't he wonderful? Do you know he's God? Do you know he's not the junior member of the Trinity? You know, you got Father, then you got Son, you got the Holy Spirit. He's not a lot shorter than the other guys. He is God. He was there when the earth was created. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit sang a beautiful trio when they threw the stars out into the sky. There are some parts of the Trinity I'll never understand, but He's God. Jesus is God. Father is God. Spirit is God. How wonderful that Jesus said, I must go away, but I will earnestly pray that the Father will send the Holy Spirit. For I can only be with you one place at a time. He has the ability to be everywhere. He can be in Dallas, Texas, where I live, and in Amsterdam or the Netherlands at the same time. How is that? I don't know. I don't care. I'm just glad. If he didn't send the Holy Spirit, we would be in big trouble. We need him everywhere, all the time. He is our teacher. As I speak to you today, he's teaching you things that I'm not saying. Because I will say something and he'll bring something to your remembrance. He'll bring a scripture verse 
as I speak that I never even thought of. He's the true teacher. I want to decrease. I want him to increase. That's why we continue to lay it all down. Lay it all down. You have nothing to bring. The, the elders around the throne of God, they're throwing their crowns down. Don't make me wear this thing. It's nothing. The lamb is here. The lamb on his throne is exalted. I can't wear a crown whenever he's here. They don't politely set their crowns at his feet. No, no. They don't politely kneel, you know, in a perfect religious way, you know. They hurl themselves off their throne. They fall as a dead man before the power and the glory of God. You don't stand in the presence of the king. You don't even kneel. You're down. That's the power of Jehovah. I spent several minutes last night in our worship time calling on that Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. I want everybody. You see, we come from all different parts of life. Some of you are having a hard week. Some of you are having a busy week. Some of you are having a great week. But we want him to move in the meeting so I sing, Holy Spirit, thou art welcome. And after that, what did we do? We sang, draw me, draw me, Lord, and I will run after you. Because we've got to get in one mind. See, if he doesn't come, folks, we just had a religious service. If he doesn't show up in his power, we've just gone through nothing. It's just a, a nice time together. But that doesn't bring change. How many of you have one of my CDs, at least, that you've heard over the years? Many of you, I hope. Have you felt the power of God on those CDs? Have they touched and changed your life? That's not from the music. Music can't change a life. Music is just vibrations. You know, strings. I mean, metal hitting nylon. <laughs> that can't change your life. But it's a vehicle for the presence. It's the presence that changes your life. It's the presence of God through you deserve the glory that made the lady not commit suicide in her car as she played it over and over and over. It's the presence of God that came into the man's room when he was dying of cancer and removed the tumor from his brain. The presence. We have nothing without his presence. 95% of the churches all over the world, much religion, no presence. No presence, no power. No power, no change. How many of you are worship leaders? Any worship leaders here? Or involved in a worship team, praise team? Several? We must have his presence. If we have a band up here and they want to show off their gifts, you're going to get a show. You're going to get a concert. There's no presence in a man's gifts. No presence in a man's voice quality. I could sing for you all night long and never change anything if I don't have him coming through my spirit and touching your life. If I'm not giving him opportunity to fill the house with his glory. And oh, I want him to fill this house with his glory so much that the priest cannot stand and minister like it was 
in the Old Testament. Hallelujah. So when you write songs, if they come from the throne of God, they will have his presence. If they come from man's intellect, they probably won't. Every song I've ever written that was any good at all came because I was having an experience with Jesus. I was sitting in the prayer room in Colorado of the United States one Sunday night before church, just worshiping with about 40 people, and that's when I Sing Praises was born that night. Just dropped it right into my heart. I just started singing. I sing praises to your name. Oh, Lord. Yeah. And what did God do with that? I had a bass player that night. He said, I had a vision when you taught that song in the service. They sang that all over the world in my vision. I said, that little song? I almost didn't teach it. I thought there wasn't a good enough song to even teach. Now people worship with that all over the world. It's so simple. When I went out and taught it that night in the church service, I didn't get halfway through and the people were singing it with me as if they already knew it. How can that be? It's because it's a song from heaven. So you started to hear something familiar because you hang around the throne of God. When you hang around his throne, you hear his sounds. And so it made sense as I started to sing it. They just started coming right along. Just, oh, yeah, we can do that. We can sing that. It was an amazing thing to watch. We've got to write songs that are from the throne of God. And we've got to educate our congregations on singing the new song because everyone in here can be a songwriter. This lady back here, whenever you sing a song to the Lord, it's different than anybody else in the church. Why? Because you're a very, very unique individual. God made you differently from anybody else on the earth. This man in the green, when you sing a song to the Lord, he gets a joy that the person next to you cannot bring him because he looks at your life and he goes, I remember when I saved him. I remember when I healed him. I remember when I delivered him. And, remember, and notice that I'm not saying all the bad things in his life. Why is that? Because God can't remember that. He can't, I'm trying, I can't remember what you're telling me about this awful thing. Why is that? God has chosen for his name's sake to bury those things in the sea of forgetfulness. So he looks back at you and he goes, I remember when I saved you. I remember when I healed you. I remember when I gave you this and that and all these blessings. And so when you sing to me, it brings me a joy that this brother can't bring me because he has a different life. He's walked a different walk. And I remember when I did this in his life. I have three sons, and they have three different personalities. I have one son that every time I see him, he kisses me. He's a kissing fool. He always kisses me. He's my firstborn, and he always kisses me. Just doesn't even think about it. My second son, he wouldn't kiss me if his life was ending. <laughs> He's just not that way. He loves me as much as the first son. He's just not a kisser. But when my mother died a few years ago, and my second son, all three of my boys were at the funeral, and it was time for them to go back to college where they were. They were going to Oral Roberts University. And so Kyle, my second son, as he's saying goodbye, he came up to me and he kissed me for the first time. And I was... Ah. 
because that was an extravagant gift. That was such a special offering. See, my oldest son, I could never feel that way because it's a, it's a wonderful thing, but it's so commonplace. Kyle gave me something he had never given me before. You come into the worship experience and you offer up to the Father something you've never given him before. And you make your daddy very happy. Every one of you has a gift you can offer to the Father that nobody else has. Charlie, there's things in you he adores that nobody else can represent but you. That's the way it is. Do you see how, how wonderful it is that we can come and worship the Father in spirit and in truth? The Word even says, that's who I'm looking for. I'm really not looking for people to sing me songs. I'm not looking for people to preach me great sermons. I'm not looking for people who can do this or that or have the most intellect or intelligence or IQ or anything. I am looking for worshipers. The real deal. He sat there talking to that woman at the well and he goes, you know what, lady? You don't impress me. I know who you're with now. I know who you've always been with. I know all the men in between. You're not even married to the one you're with now. And I don't even care. My dad's looking for worshipers. Wake up, lady. There's a life to be lived here. Walk in the light. Dad's looking for worshipers. You're invited to be one. She was never the same again when she looked into his eyes and he said, be a worshiper. Runs into the village, you got to come meet this guy. And they're looking at her like, what, what are you doing now? No, but something's different about her now. you got to come meet him. He told me everything I've ever done and he loves me. He invited me to be a worshiper. The Father is seeking worshipers in, in the Netherlands. He is seeking a people who will just lay it all down. And as that happens, His light will fill your nation. His light will fill your church sanctuary. You let his presence be the Lord of your services. He will bring them in from the streets and they will fall in repentance because that is truth. He wants to come and visit you in a brand new way. Amen? All right. Let's sing one more song and then I'll turn it back over to Robin. Stand together. I praises to your name, oh Lord, for your name. Thank you. 
look in his eyes. Look in his eyes, saints. For your name is great and great. that are represented in this conference, that you would visit those worship services with new life and new grace and new hope and new freedom and the song of the redeemed. Set them free to worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. We take authority over religious tradition and all those things that drag man down. Set us free, Jesus. Let's give him a hand clap. Robin. <laughs> 